The lecture today will be on the concept of temperature, heat, and the first law of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is the branch of physics that deals with temperature and thermal energy and how systems exchange thermal energy and how they interact with each other in terms of exchange of heat. Processes such as um, phase changes, thermal equilibrium, um, various processes involving gases such as uh, work done by a gas, um, expansion without change in pressure, or expansion um, without change in temperature are all processes that are studied by thermodynamics. The first important quantity in the thermodynamics branch of physics is the concept of temperature. So temperature is related to the sense of hot or cold and the tool that measures temperature is the thermometer. And thermometers contain a certain working substance with a measurable property such as length or pressure. And so that property changes in a consistent regular way as the substance becomes hotter or colder. In the metric system, the base unit for temperature is the Kelvin. And the scale on which temperature is measured is the Kelvin scale. However, in everyday applications, um, a scale that is often used is the Celsius scale. And the label for the units in the Celsius scale are degrees Celsius. The zeroth law of thermodynamics is related to the concept of temperature and also the concept of thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium. So before we talk about thermal equilibrium and the zero law of thermodynamics, a few words about um, how heat flows between objects. So heat flows always from hotter to a colder object. So let's take two objects, object A, which is hot, so it's at high temperature. And let's take another object, B, which is cold, meaning it's at lower temperature compared to A. So if those two objects are brought in contact, so uh, physically, heat will flow between the two and those always in the direction from A to B. So the heat flows from A to B. So when does the heat flow stop is another question that we can ask in regards to those two objects A and B. Well, if the two objects are at the same temperature, then when they are brought in contact, heat will net not flow between the two. And so when two objects are at the same temperature, we say that they are at thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium. And so the zero law of thermodynamics is about thermal equilibrium. So consider the two objects A and B placed in a enclosure like sh such as the one shown in the cartoon here. Um, the two objects are uh, separated by a um, thermally insulating barrier and object A is placed in contact 
object with the third object T, which could be a thermometer, and the two are in thermal equilibrium. Um, how do we know that the thermometer is in thermal equilibrium with object A? Well, once the thermometer stops changing the reading of temperature, that then the thermometer and object A are in thermal equilibrium. Okay, so now if I take the thermometer and place it in contact with object B, and the reading of the thermometer remains the same as when it was in contact with object A, then that means that object B is at the same temperature as object A. So then if I remove the barrier and put objects A and B in contact, there will be no heat flow between the two objects. And so therefore they are in thermal equilibrium. So if I have two objects that are not in contact with each other, and I determine that both objects are at the same temperature, then that means that they are in thermal equilibrium, even though we've never put the objects in contact and there was never exchange of heat. Just the fact that they are at the same temperature means that they are in thermal equilibrium. And so the statement of the zero law of thermodynamics is that if bodies A and B are each in thermal equilibrium with a third body T, then A and B are in thermal thermal equilibrium with each other. So this is a very important um, law in thermal physics because we know for sure that when two objects are at different temperatures, there will be a heat exchange. Heat will flow between the two and it will always flow from the hotter to the colder object naturally. Let's explain the temperature scales used to measure temperature. Um, so again, the standard scale for measuring temperature in the metric system is the Kelvin scale. And on the Kelvin scale, the lowest possible temperature that can exist is called the absolute zero, and that corresponds to zero Kelvin. So that would be the temperature of an object when all of the thermal energy that the object contains is removed from it and no more energy is left. Think about it this way. Imagine you have, um, let's say, a cube made from steel at room temperature. So the way to lower the temperature of this cube is to remove heat from it. We know that when heat flows away from an object, its temperature will drop. All right, so we remove heat until the temperature doesn't drop anymore. And so that is the lowest possible temperature achievable, and that is known as zero Kelvin. Okay, so then any temperature that's higher than that will be a positive number. Okay, so... Um, to match the Kelvin temperature scale with the more commonly used Celsius scale, we choose the triple point of water, which is the temperature at which water exists in its three phases at the same time. Vapor, liquid, and solid or ice. So um, this temperature is um, set to be zero degrees Celsius. Uh, and on the Kelvin scale, that is 273.16 Kelvin. So, um, the triple point of water on the Kelvin scale is 273.16 Kelvin, 0 0.01 degrees Celsius, and matched to the Fahrenheit scale, that is 32.02 degrees Fahrenheit. The absolute zero is zero degrees Kelvin, minus 273.15 degrees Celsius and um, minus 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit. So based on that information here, um, relationships can be derived that convert between the temperature scales. So for example, um, if I wanted to convert temperature from Kelvin into Celsius, I would take the temperature 
in Kelvin and subtract 273.15 degrees from that. If I wanted to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit, I would take the temperature in Celsius degrees, multiply by 9, divide by 5, and then add 32 to the result. And the formula that converts from um, Fahrenheit to Celsius would be the temperature in Celsius is, is equal to 5 ninths, the temperature in Fahrenheit minus 32. So those three relationships are good to convert between the three uh, temperature scales. A property of materials related to the exchange of heat, so absorption or release of heat, is the change of physical dimensions or expansion. So first let's look at the linear expansion um, associated with change in temperature. So um, consider a rod with initial length L and add some initial temperature T sub I. So if I heat up the rod So place a heat source, um, let's say, on the left end of the rod. Um, as a result of the heat that is um, given to the rod, the rod will change its length. It's going to become longer. So the change will be delta L. And now the temperature of the rod will increase to a different value. Let's call it Tf. So then I can write a relationship <sighs> so table 18-2 so what applications are there to that effect, that um, phenomenon of linear expansion. Well, for example, one could make a bimetal strip, such as the one shown here, made from two different metals, one being brass, the other one steel. And so when the temperature of this strip is increased, the two metals will expand, but one of them will expand more than the other. The brass will expand more than the steel, which will cause this strip to bend down like so. So this can be used for um, thermocouples as a switch. Uh, it can be used also as a switch in an electric circuit. And of course, it's used simply as a thermometer. For example, a cooking thermometer that you would stick in a turkey, let's say. So there is a bimetal strip in this thermometer that will change length with temperature change. And this strip is connected to a dial. And so when the dial moves, you could read the temperature on a gauge. So the concept of linear expansion only applies to solids. So solid objects. Uh, this does not apply to gases or liquids because they do not have their own uh, defined shapes. Um, to be able to um, determine the expansion of any substance, solid, liquid, or gas, we would use, more specifically solids and liquids actually, we would use um, the concept of volume expansion. So, for volume expansion, if I start with a solid or a liquid with some initial volume V at some initial temperature T sub I, and I subject 
that to a heat source that's going to cause the volume to change so this substance will expand and the amount of expansion will be delta v and the new temperature after some time will be t sub f so i can relate the amount of expansion delta v with the original volume v and the change in temperature tf minus ti and this relationship is given by the formula here so the change in volume is equal to the original volume times this coefficient beta times the change in temperature delta t so beta is the coefficient of volume expansion and this coefficient is measured in units of 1 over degree celsius 1 over kelvin or 1 over degree fahrenheit so for solids specifically we can relate the coefficient of volume expansion with the coefficient of linear expansion and that relationship is given by this formula here the coefficient of volume expansion beta is equal to three times the coefficient of linear expansion alpha so why is that if you look at a solid bar like so when this bar is heated up its temperature will increase and so therefore each dimension will increase and um, the dimension increases will be independent of each other so therefore he, one could combine the three um, expansions to calculate volume expansion by multiplying the coefficient of linear expansion by three since the expansion will be um, is for the same material so the coefficient is the same for each dimension so three times the coefficient of linear expansion is equal to a coefficient of volume expansion and again this is only for solids let's do a simple example problem um, regarding or using the concept of linear expansion so we have a circular hole in an aluminum plate um, with a diameter of 2.725 centimeters at zero degrees Celsius. So what is the diameter when the temperature of the plate is 100 degrees Celsius? So the change in the diameter of the hole will be delta D and that will be calculated as the product of the original diameter D, the coefficient of linear expansion of aluminum, and the change in temperature of the plate. So the final value for the diameter then will be D prime equals to D plus D alpha aluminum delta T. So looking um, if I take a look at table 18-2, I see that aluminum has a coefficient of linear expansion alpha equal to 23 times 10 to the negative sixth, 1 over degree Celsius. The change in temperature delta T is simply 100 degrees Celsius minus 0 degrees Celsius. So, so that is 100 Celsius degrees. And now I have all the information necessary to answer the question. So I will substitute all these numbers in this relationship right here and get the result. So the final result of the calculation is... 2.731 centimeters so that is the length that is the new diameter of the hole in this aluminum plate so up to this point i discussed temperature and how the change in temperature affects certain behaviors of objects such as expansion due to the increase or decrease in temperature now let's look at the other um, important concept that is the subject of thermal physics and that is heat so for the purposes of the discussion first let's define what is a system 
let's look at <clears throat> a simple um, object, quote unquote, and that would be a cup of tea. So we have some tea in this cup, and let's say that this tea is at temperature that is higher than, you know, the room temperature. So the tea is hot. All right, so if we leave the cup of tea um, on its own without doing anything to it, the expectation, and we know that from everyday experience, is that heat will leave this cup of tea. So heat will flow into the surroundings. And as a result, the temperature of um, the tea here in the cup will slowly um, decrease until the temperature of the tea is the same as the temperature of the surroundings. And then um, thermal equilibrium is achieved. Okay, so another example would be the opposite direction of heat flow. Um, I can look at a can of Coke. And we know that um, when you take this out of the fridge, it's cold. So it's at temperature that's lower than the surrounding temperature. So what we know from experience is that with time, the temperature of the can is going to increase until it becomes the same as the temperature of the surroundings. So heat will flow into the um, can. So we can discuss the behavior of various objects, quote unquote, in regards to how heat flows to, into them or out of them. And so in our discussions, those objects will be named a system. So the hot can, I'm sorry, the, uh, the cup of tea or the cold can would be a system which will either absorb heat or release heat. And I can talk about a system, for example, um, for a assembly of gas molecules. For example, a cylinder that's filled with air. And so the molecules inside will move uh, based on how much heat is either added or removed from the air. So that assembly uh, of molecules is also a system. So a system can be any kind of object. It can be a solid, it can be liquid, or it can be gas. So all of these examples um, are examples of a system. So everything else that is not the system is called the environment. So for the cup of tea, the cold can of Coke, and the metal cube or the gas in the cylinder, the surroundings, which typically is just, you know, um, room air, are called the environment. And so when we are dealing with processes where heat flows, we are talking about the system, and then we are talking about the environment, what surrounds the system. Now, I can ask a question, which is very important, and that question is, what exactly is heat? Well, so heat is a form of energy, uh, which we label with capital Q, but that is not energy that can be stored 
such as, for example, kinetic energy or potential energy. So this is not an energy that can be stored in an object. It's more um, like an energy that actually flows from an object or into an object. So from the system or into the system. So heat is energy that flows. That's the most general um, way to describe it. Just like any other kind of energy, though, the units for heat are joules. And so this um, unit was adopted because James Joule was able to show that when mechanical work is performed on a system, the energy, uh, the temperature of the system increases, which means that energy is imparted into the system. And the other way around, uh, the process can be reversed. So a system which has high temperature can do mechanical work on the environment. And so as a result, heat is released into the environment and the temperature of the system decreases. But before James Joule was able to establish that relationship, uh, heat was measured in different units. And those units are calories in the metric system and BTUs in the imperial system. So heat can be measured in all of these units, depending on the um, problem at hand. And so again, those units are joules or calories or BTUs. So what is a calorie? So one calorie is the amount of heat necessary to heat up one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So increase the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So this is a small um, amount of heat and so therefore we have a unit that is a thousand times um, larger and that is the kilocalorie. And that will be the amount of heat necessary to increase the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. And so again, James Joule uh, found the relationship between mechanical work and heat. And this is known as uh, the mechanical work equivalent and the equivalent states that one calorie of heat is equal to 4.1868 joules of work. So this can be used to do conversions when problems are, when you deal with problems involving heat transfer. Okay, now let's look at um, a system and its environment and how heat is transferred, depending on the temperature difference between the system and its environment. So first, um, we have a system that is at higher temperature compared to its environment. So the temperature of the system TS is larger than the temperature of the environment TE. So then we know that in this case, temperature uh, heat will leave the system and it will be deposited into the environment. Well, when that process uh, happens, we consider the heat that has left the system to be a negative number. When the temperature of the system and environment are the same, then the two are at thermal equilibrium, so therefore there is no heat flow between the system and the environment. And so therefore, the amount of heat exchange is equal to zero. And finally, we can have a situation where the system is at lower temperature compared to the environment. So the temperature of the system is smaller than the temperature of the environment, in which case heat will flow from the environment into the system. And then the amount of heat that the system received is a positive number. 
So when the system receives heat, that is considered a positive amount. When the system releases heat, that is considered a negative amount. Now let's talk about the absorption of heat by solids and liquids. Heat capacity, C, of an object is the proportionality constant between the heat Q that the object absorbs or loses and the resulting temperature change, delta T, of the object. And so this relationship can be written as Q, the amount of heat absorbed or lost by the object, is equal to the heat capacity C times the change in temperature. When accounting for the mass of the object, the re above relationship can be rewritten as the amount of heat um, received or lost is equal to the specific heat C, so lowercase c, times the mass of this object times the change in temperature. So here from this second relationship, it is clear that as the mass of the object or substance increases, so would the amount of heat necessary for a certain change in temperature. So if the change in temperature is fixed, but the mass increases, that means that more heat must be um, given to the substance or object in order for that change in temperature to occur. The units for specific heat um, can be, uh, depend on the, how the problem is stated and what the units of the other quantities are. So for example, the specific heat can be in calories per gram Kelvin. It also can be calories per gram degree Celsius. It can be in joules per kilogram Kelvin, joules per kilogram degree Celsius. And those are used when the mass is in kilograms. When the mass is expressed in moles, then the specific heat is renamed to be molar specific heat. And then the units will be, for example, joules per mole Kelvin. So the specific heat is an uh, important quantity, actually, because if I rewrite the above relationship, I can uh, find an expression for the specific heat, and that is Q divided by M delta T. So what I did here is I essentially normalized um, for the mass of the substance or object, meaning... Um, if I look at that definition here, the mass increases or decreases, that is going to change the amount of heat necessary for the same temperature change. Well, now, if I increase the mass, I'm also increasing the amount of heat. So this ratio will be constant, um, will be the same as if I decrease that mass because then the amount of heat necessary for this temperature change will decrease. So this ratio here will scale up or down, um, I'm sorry, the ratio will remain the same, no, the same no matter how much I increase or decrease the mass because the amount of heat will increase or decrease proportionally for the same amount of, uh, for the same temperature change. And so now this uh, quantity here, the specific heat can be um, used as a identifier of various substances because different substances will require different amount of heat for the same amount of mass and the same temperature change. And so the higher the specific heat for a certain substance, the more heat this substance can absorb or hold and release to the environment. And so this has applications in, for example, heating and cooling. So water is a substance with um, the highest specific heat of the common use substances. And water can hold a lot of heat. So it can absorb a lot of heat for a certain temperature change. Or it can release a lot of heat for a certain temperature change. 
And so, for example, geothermal heating and cooling it uses um, exactly that property of water. And then in the car industry, um, cooling of engines is um, done with using water, except for additives are necessary there since water has a very small range of operation. It boils at very low temperature and freezes at very high temperature. And so adding ethylene glycol to the water um, increases the range of operation. And we call this um, new substance, quote unquote, antifreeze. So the specific heat is a quantity, the value of which can tell us whether certain material will require a lot of heat or less heat in order for a certain temperature change. So very often when heat is released by a system into its environment or absorbed by the system from the environment, that results in a change of phase of the material from which the system is made. For example, if we grab a cube of ice and leave it in a cup of water at room temperature, the ice is going to absorb heat from the water surrounding it. And as a result, it's going to start to melt eventually. So a phase change is occurring. Similarly, if I put some water on the stove and turn up the heat, eventually the water will start to boil and it will evaporate after some time. So all that liquid has become vapors. So another phase change has occurred. So the amount of energy per unit mass that must be transferred as heat when a sample completely undergoes a phase change is called heat of transformation L. So when a sample of mass M completely undergoes a phase change, the total energy transferred is calculated as Q equal to the heat of transformation L times the mass of this sample. So depending on the type of uh, phase change, we have two different heat of transformation to discuss. Um, the names are different just because of the kind of phase transition that is happening. And so when we are dealing with melting or uh, solidifying, we talk about heat of fusion, which we label with L sub F. And so for various materials, that quantity is known. Um, in table 18-4, some of those are provided. And when we, ha when we talk about evaporation or boiling, the, then we, ha we talk about heat of vaporization. And this is labeled with L sub V. And again, in the same table, 18-4, there are certain, um, there's some heat of vaporization listed for some materials. One other um, point to be made, which is actually an important um, consideration, is that during phase changes, the temperature of the mixture of the two phases is constant until the phase change is complete. So for example, if you have some ice in a cup of water, the temperature of the mixture, ice and water, is zero degrees Celsius until all of the ice has melted, and then the temperature of the water is going to start to increase. So the phase change happens at constant temperature. And the same applies for, let's say, boiling water. So we bring water to a boil, so that happens at 100 degrees Celsius. The water starts to boil and starts to evaporate. And so until all of the water has evaporated, the temperature of the mixture, water and water vapors, will be 100 degrees Celsius. After all of the water has evaporated, 
if I continue to add heat to the system, then the temperature of the vapors will start to increase above 100 degrees Celsius. And so one more time, phase changes happen at constant temperature until the change is completed. Let's look at some example problems um, using the concept of um, heat and transfer of heat and phase change in order to illustrate the concepts a little bit. So first, uh, we have a copper slug whose mass is 75 grams and it's heated in a lab oven to a temperature of 312 degrees Celsius. The slug is then dropped into a glass beaker containing 220 grams of water. The heat capacity CB of the beaker is 45 calories per Kelvin. The initial temperature of the water in the beaker is 12 degrees Celsius. Assuming that the slug beaker and water are an isolated system, which means there is no heat exchange with the surroundings. And the water doesn't vaporize, find the final temperature of the system at thermal equilibrium. So, again, a few points to be made here. First of all, the system is in um, is thermally isolated from the environment, which means that there is no heat transfer between the system and the environment. So no heat transfer between the system and the environment. The second um, thing we get from the statement of the problem is that there is no phase changes here. So the bullet or the slug is at a um, certain temperature, but it is not melting. It's introduced to water at lower temperature. So that means that the slug will lose heat. The water will accept heat, but we also know that the water doesn't vaporize. So therefore, there is no phase changes in this problem. So all the heat transfers will only um, change the temperatures of the components of the system. So that's the slug, the water, and the beaker. So no phase changes occur in this process. Okay, so now let's write expressions for the heat, the amounts of heat that each component of the system receives or uh, loses. So for the water, Q water is equal to the specific heat of water times the mass of water times the change in temperature of the water. For the beaker, Q beaker is equal to the heat capacity of the beaker CB times the change in temperature of the beaker. And finally for the copper, um, <clears throat> QC is equal to the specific heat of copper times the mass of copper times the change in temperature of copper. Furthermore, the system does not exchange heat with the environment, which means that the total energy of the system is conserved. The total energy is conserved, which means that if I add all of these three heats together, QW plus QB plus QC, that will be equal to zero. So the heats are only exchanged inside that system. And so, for example, the water will accept heat from the copper. The beaker will accept heat from the copper. So those two will be positive numbers, but the heat released by the copper will be negative number. And so when you add the three together, you get the zero. All right, so now I'm going to substitute um, these expressions for the three heats in the total energy equation. So after substitution, I get this fairly long expression here. And then I solve for the final temperature. And so the final temperature is equal to that expression here. So now I can um, substitute all the values that I already have 
in here and calculate the final result. So substituting all the values in the <clears throat> above um, equation, um, I get the result to be 20 degrees Celsius for the final temperature of the entire system. So the copper piece, the beaker and the water all end up at 20 degrees Celsius. Let's look at one more problem. This one is about phase changes. So how much heat must be absorbed by ice of mass of 720 grams at minus 10 degrees Celsius to take it to the liquid state at 15 degrees Celsius. So here we have three steps that are happening in order for the ice to um, be brought from negative 10 degrees Celsius to liquid state at 15 degrees Celsius. So the first step is the ice absorbs heat to increase temperature from negative 10 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius. So the ice cannot start to melt before it reaches zero degrees Celsius. The, step on, the second step is a phase change. So the ice and water mixture is at zero degrees Celsius um, until the ice has melted. And then the last step is energy is transferred to the water to rise its temperature from zero degrees Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's work out the first step. So the ice is heated up from negative 10 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius. So the amount of heat that the ice must receive in order to increase its temperature from negative 10 degrees Celsius to zero Celsius is the specific heat of ice times the mass of ice times the temperature change. So the specific heat of ice is in the table in the chapter, uh, 18 dash, um, two. So that is 2,220 joules per kilogram Kelvin times the mass of the ice, which is 0 0.720 kilograms times zero degrees Celsius minus negative 10 degrees Celsius. And then the result of this calculation is 15.98 kilojoules. The second step is the melting of the ice in the water. So again, this is a phase transition. So it happens at the same temperature and that would be zero degrees Celsius. So that amount of heat necessary to melt the ice is equal to the heat of fusion of ice times the mass of ice. The heat of fusion of ice is 333 kilojoules per kilogram. The mass of ice is 0 0.720 kilograms. And so the result is that the amount of heat necessary to melt the ice is 239.8 kilojoules. And the last step is to heat up the water um, from zero degrees Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius. So the ice has melted. So now we have water at zero degrees Celsius. We want to bring it up to 15 degrees Celsius. So let's see how much heat is necessary for that. So the amount of heat necessary to heat up the water from zero degrees Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius would be the specific heat of water times the mass of the melted ice. Uh, that's the mass of the water times the change in temperature. So that is 4,186.8 joules per kilogram Kelvin times 0 0.720 kilograms times 15 degrees Celsius minus zero degrees Celsius. And the result of that calculation is 45.22 kilojoules. So now I must add all of these three amounts of heat together to get the total amount of heat that is necessary for this process to complete from heating up the ice from negative 10 degrees Celsius all the way to increasing the temperature of the whole the melted ice from zero to 15 degrees Celsius. So the process from minus 10, minus 10 degrees Celsius to plus 15 degrees Celsius. So add it all together, the three amounts of heat gives us 300 kilojoules. Let's discuss the ways that a system can transition from one state into another state. So consider our system, which again can be a solid, can be a liquid, can be a gas. Um, 
for our purposes of discussion and to be able to define first law of thermodynamics, I'm going to consider the system to be made from molecules, gas molecules. So we have some gas here. All right, so this gas is at some initial pressure, Pi, some initial volume, Vi, and some initial temperature, Ti. And then after some time, the system transitions to a different state. So this is the initial state. And this is a final state. And so the final state is characterized by some final pressure, final volume, and final temperature in general. So again, this is gas. So the process of transition from the initial state to the final state is called thermodynamic process. A thermodynamic process. So we're going to discuss several different thermodynamic processes um, that can bring a system from some initial state into a final state. So during the process of thermodynamic process, uh, during the happening of the thermodynamic process, heat is being exchanged and work is being done. So uh, the two important quantities that we are going to um, discuss here are heat and its relation to mechanical work. And so when heat is exchanged and work is done, then you in general would see that the pressure of the system changes, the volume of the system changes and the temperature of the system changes. Now, depending on the specific thermodynamic process that um, brings the system from the initial state to the final state, some of these quantities may remain constant. So here is my thermodynamic system. So I have a cylinder that is closed on one end and then on the other end I have a piston that can move and inside the cylinder I have some gas. Now the cylinder is placed on a hot plate which I'm going to call the thermal reservoir and so this hot plate can supply heat to the system. So since the piston can move if I load it with some weight it's uh, will be able to apply pressure on the gas in the cylinder and thus it will be able to do work. Okay, so first let's um, increase the temperature of the hot plate and so therefore heat is flowing into the system. So that means that the system um, receives a positive amount of heat. If I reverse the procedure, meaning I decrease the temperature of the hot plate, so the temperature of the hot plate is uh, less than the temperature of the gas in the cylinder, then heat will leave the gas and therefore a negative amount of heat is being transferred. So when the hot plate is hotter than the gas, positive amount of heat is transferred to the gas from the hot plate. When the hot plate temperature is lower than the gas, then heat leaves the gas, so negative amount of heat is being transferred from the gas to the hot plate. When the gas expands, it is going to move the piston, and so then positive work is being done by the system. When the piston pushes down on the gas, then the gas is being compressed, and negative work is being done on the system. So when the gas moves the piston, the system does work and the work done is positive. When the piston compresses the gas, work is done on the system and that amount of work is negative. So how can I calculate the amount of work done um, 
by this uh, system. So the amount of work done by the system in an infinitesimal amount, dW, is equal to the dot product of the force um, on the piston times uh, the infinitesimal displacement of the piston ds. So since the force is perpendicular to, uh, is parallel to the displacement, this simply becomes f ds. And now I can replace the force with its um, equivalent, which is the product of pressure and the surface area of the piston. So that is equal to PA times dS. And now dS is infinitesimal vertical displacement. A is the area of the piston, surface area of the piston. So the product of the two is the infinitesimal change in volume as the piston is being moved. So that is P times dV. So the work done, dW is equal to P dV. So if I integrate, then I can find the total work done. So that's what this integral here is. So the work done um, by the gas as it expands is equal to the integral from the initial volume value to a final volume value of P dV. And so this integra uh, int integration is necessary because the pressure here is not necessarily constant during the process of change in volume. So again, when the gas expands, the piston is being moved by a small distance dS. And so the work done on the piston would be equal to the force applied on the piston times dS. Um, since the two vectors are parallel to each other, that dot product simply becomes F dS. Now F is equal to the pressure on the piston times the surface area of the piston, so that is P times A. And then on another hand, A times the S is equal to the volume change here due to the um, gas moving the piston up. So that is P times dV. And so I integrate this um, relationship to get an expression for the work done by the gas. So that's an integral of V initial to V final P dV. So the process that I described takes the gas from one value of the volume to another volume of, the value of the volume of the gas. And in the process of that change, the pressure of the gas can change in various ways. So that means that the thermodynamically, there are multiple paths that can take the system from its initial state to its final state. So, for example, I can plot the pressure versus volume um, relationship for the gas as it expands, and I can in, then um, analyze how the uh, thermodynamic process um, occurred. So, in the first <clears throat> plot here, we have the two values of the volume, initial and final, and then we have the pressure of um, the gas dropping from some initial value to some final value. Okay, so the gas is doing work on the piston, so that means that the work done is positive, and really the value of the work done is the area under the curve here. Okay, um, different path of the process is also possible, and that is shown in the next uh, plot where the pressure is kept constant all the time during the change in volume process. And then once the volume has changed from its initial to its final value, then the pressure is dropped to its final value while keep it, keeping the volume constant. So we have uh, constant pressure as the volume changes between the two values, and then we have change in pressure as the volume is kept the same. Another pos and so the work done is positive, and that is the uh, area under the curve here. 
we have a different path uh, possible, which is shown in figure C here, and that is the pressure initially is dropped from its initial to its final value while the volume is kept constant. And then the pressure is kept constant while the volume is being increased. So let's um, look at the system, which is the gas in the, pist in the cylinder and the piston in the hot plate, and <clears throat> how these three cases correspond to what's happening here. So the first case would be um, the gas is being heated up, as a result, it expands, and so um, the heat is turned off, the gas expands, it moves the piston, so the volume increases, but the pressure decreases. Okay, the second graph here shows us um, a volume expansion at constant pressure, so that means that the heat here is turned on, and then it's kept on, so as the gas expands, the pressure remains constant. But now once the uh, final volume is reached right here, uh, the heat is um, turned off. And so the gas loses energy. It gives it back to the hot plate and the pressure drops. In figure C, uh, what happens is the hot plate is at lower temperature than the gas. So heat leaves the gas. Uh, the piston doesn't move at that time. And so once the pressure of the gas is decreased, um, then the piston is allowed to move and um, it reaches its, uh, the, the gas reaches its final volume. Figure E here shows a reverse of the process and negative work is done as a result. So the gas starts at this final volume value, so the cylinder is somewhere up here, and it starts to compress the gas. So, um, the initial value of the pressure of the gas is small, but as the volume decreases, as the piston pushes down, so the volume decreases, as the process goes from F to I, the pressure will increase. And so, since the difference in volumes here is negative, the work done is negative. So again, it's still equal to the area under this curve. Figure F shows what we call a cyclic process. Cyclic process for which the system is taken from some initial state to some final state. And so we know that <clears throat> in this process, positive amount of work is done. Then the system is taken back from its final state to its initial state along a different thermodynamic path, along which process negative amount of work is done. And so adding the two amounts of work will, produce, will give us the net work result. And so depending on whether the work done from, uh, to bring the system from its initial state to the final state is bigger uh, or smaller than the network done to bring the system from its final state to its initial state, the result will be either a positive network or negative network. In this particular case, that's a positive network. And so after discussing um, what a thermodynamic process is and how a system can be brought from some initial state to a final state, through a thermodynamic process, we arrive at the concept of the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is simply a conservation of energy statement in the context of heat transfer and work done as a result. So the principle of conservation of energy for a thermodynamic process is expressed in the first law of thermodynamics, which may assume one of those two forms. So the change in internal energy is equal to the difference between some final value of the internal energy and some initial value of the internal energy. And this can be calculated as the difference between the heat transferred and the work done in the process. 
So the amount of heat Q is considered to be a positive number when it is absorbed by the system and Q is negative when it is released by the system. Or when it's lost by the system. And similarly, the amount of work W is positive when it is done by the system and it is negative when it is done on the system. Just to link it one more time with the example of the gas in the cylinder and the moving piston and the hot plate. When the hot plate is at temperature higher than the gas in the cylinder, heat is added to the gas. So um, that is considered to be a positive number. When the gas is hotter than the hot plate, heat is leaving the gas. And so heat, that amount of heat will be considered to be a negative number. The system releases that amount of heat. When the gas expands and moves the piston up, it increases the volume of the gas. So the gas does positive work or the system does positive work on um, the piston. When the piston pushes down on the gas to compress it, the volume of the gas decreases. And so the work done is negative. It's done on the system. The work done is negative, it's done on the system. When the thermodynamic system undergoes only a differential change, then the first law of thermodynamics can be written in this form. And so the statement of this, the first law is that the internal energy of a system tends to increase if energy is added as heat Q and tends to decrease if energy is lost as work W done by the system. Now, depending on exactly how the system is brought from its initial state to its final state, we have several different possible um, thermodynamic paths. So the first one is called the adiabatic process, uh, which is a process where there is no thermal exchange as the process is happening. So the amount of heat Q that's being transferred is equal to zero. So this process usually happens extremely fast and there is no time for any heat to be exchanged. In this case, the change of internal energy of the system is just equal to the negative of the work done by the system. Or more, um, more accurately, um, the change in internal energy is equal to the negative of the work. So if the system does work, um, then the change in internal energy is... Uh, negative is work is if work is done on the system the t the change in internal energy is positive uh, keeping into account the signs that I discussed on the previous slide another way to uh, bring the system from s some initial state to a final state would be a process that occurs when the volume is kept constant in this case the work done is zero and there is only exchange of heat so the change in internal energy is equal to the heat exchanged uh, between the system and the environment. We have a process which can be um, done as a closed cycle, which means the system is brought from initial state to a final state and then back to that initial state, in which case the change of internal energy is equal to zero, since there is no exchange with the environment. And then in this case, the amount of heat transferred is equal to the amount of work done. And then of course we have a free expansion process where the gas is just in the cylinder is let to expand on its own. And so in this case, heat is not transferred to the gas or from the gas. And the gas is not moving a piston. There is no piston there. So the gas does no work. So those two quantities are equal to zero. And then the change in internal energy is also equal to zero. Now let's talk a little bit about <clears throat> thermal conduction. So uh, consider two um object one is at higher temperature and so we are going to call this object the hot reservoir and another object which is at lower temperature we are going to call this one the cold reservoir the hot reservoir is at temperature th the cold reservoir is at temperature tc and so i want to transfer heat between the two so i can't bring them in 
uh, direct contact. So I'm going to use a slab of some material that is going to um, be used as a medium to transfer uh, heat from the hot reservoir to the cold reservoir. So the rate P at which energy is conducted through that slab um, is calculated as the amount of heat transferred divided by T, where T is the time for this uh, transfer to uh, complete. And so this can be written as the product of um, the thermal conductivity K, which is a property of this material here in, from which the slab is made. The surface area of the sides of this slab. And then we have the difference in temperatures between the hot and the cold reservoir. And then finally, um, that, is, that is divided by the length of path of heat. So basically the thickness of the slab. So again, the rate of conduction of uh, energy is proportional to the thermal conductivity of this material, the surface area of this material, the difference in temperatures between the hot and the cold reservoirs, and then the distance through the material that the, um, the heat um, is traveling from the hot reservoir to the cold reservoir. And so by the nature of which um, heat is conducted or heat is transferred, we have three um, main um, processes. So the first one is conduction. I explained that already. So this only happens when we have solid objects. So this only can happen between solids. Convection is another way of heat transfer and that is uh, the process that happens in fluids, so in gases and liquids. So convection occurs when temperature differences cause energy transfer by motion within a fluid. Um, a simple example of that process would be um, boiling of water. So if you put a, a pot of uh, water at the temperature of the tap, um, on the hot plate and turn it on and you, st you know, you pay attention, you will see how inside the water volume, there is this movement, like columns of um, water moving around um, with respect to the entire volume of water. And so those are um, clusters of molecules, if you will, that have uh, received energy from the hot plate and now are moving away from the hot plate in <clears throat> a fairly random manner. But <clears throat> when these molecules move away, their place is taken by different molecules which have less energy. They get energized by the hot plate and then they move away. At the same time, the molecules that have uh, being energized initially or before, have moved away, they have lost some energy through collisions with the other molecules, now they can fall back towards the bottom. So as you know, colder, um, in the fluid, the colder, uh, colder molecules of the fluid fall towards the bottom and the hotter ones go towards the top. <clears throat> so there is this constant process of sort of circulation of more energized molecules and less energized molecules, which essentially um, forms a convection current of the fluid. And so through that convection current, eventually energy is transferred to the entire you know, fluid through collisions. And so the temperature of the fluid rises. And so after a while for the water in the pot, what you will see is that the water will start to boil. And finally, uh, the last mechanism of uh, heat transfer is thermal radiation. And this is a process that does not require a medium. And so it's a process of energy transfer via emission of electromagnetic energy. 
So the rate P at which an object emits energy via thermal radiation is proportional to a constant, sigma, which is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. It's proportional to the emissivity of the object surface, and that is <clears throat> a number between 0 and 1. It's proportional to the surface area of the object, and it's proportional to the temperature of the object in Kelvin to the fourth power. Similarly, one could define the rate at which energy is absorbed by an object. So this is also proportional to the Stefan Boltzmann constant, the emissivity of the object's surface, the surface area of the object, but now this is proportional to the temperature of the environment to the fourth power, and this temperature is in Kelvin. And so then the net um, energy exchange is calculated as the difference between the absorption rate and the radiation rate. Now let's go back to um, thermodynamic processes uh, and do a simple example uh, of such a process. So we have one kilogram of water at 100 degrees Celsius is to be converted at, <clears throat> to steam at 100 degrees Celsius by boiling at standard atmospheric pressure. Uh, in the arrangement uh, shown in the figure, so that is basically the gas in the cylinder. The volume of that water changes from its initial value of 1 times 10 to the negative 3 cubic meters as a liquid to 1.671 cubic meters as steam. So the question is how much work is done by the system during the process. So here is uh, my system. So I have a hot plate, I have a cylinder, and then I have some liquid water here, and then the cylinder is closed with a piston that's weighted, and so the piston can move up or down. So initially the process starts with just liquid water at some initial volume, and um, he, the water is converted into steam, and as a result, the volume changes. So the question is how much, how much work is done by the system during this process? So first of all, <clears throat> the volume of the system increases, so therefore the work done by the system is a positive number. The pressure is <clears throat> also constant because in the statement of the problem, it says that the process of boiling the water to steam happens at standard atmospheric pressure, so the pressure doesn't change. So to calculate the work done, I'm going to calculate this integral where the pressure is constant. So it comes in front of the integral and the integral itself is just the difference in volumes after and before the process is uh, done. So substituting the values for the pressure and the two volumes, um, the result is that the work done is 169 kilojoules. Now let's calculate how much energy is transferred as heat during the process. So <clears throat> this is a phase change process. The water is boiling to become steam. So that means that the calculation of the heat will happen with <clears throat> the formula Q is equal to the um, heat of vaporization times the mass of water. Substituting the known uh, values for the heat of vaporization of water, which is 2,256 kilojoules per kilogram, times the mass of the water, which is 1 kilogram, we get 2,256 uh, 2, kilojoules. So that's the amount, the amount of heat necessary to convert all of the water from liquid to water vapor. Now I can ask a different question, and that is, what's the change in internal energy during the process for the system? Well, so the conservation of energy, um, or the first law of thermodynamics, states that the internal energy change is equal to Q minus W. And we know both, so that is 2,256 kilojoules minus 169 kilojoules. And so that is equal to... 2,090 kilojoules 
or that is 2.09 megajoules. So here, since um, heat is added to the system, um, the amount of heat is positive. And so since the system um, does work, the amount of work is also a positive number. So there is no change in sign here from the definition of uh, the first law of thermodynamics.